Let's begin. Sorry for the delay. But isn't that brighter? I don't think it was necessarily worth it, but it is brighter. Uh, we're going to continue talking about precipitation today and hopefully have time to get into evaporation. The good news is that um, the schedule has a little bit of slack in it in terms of how much time is scheduled for evaporation. So even though we're a little bit behind, I don't think it'll sink us too badly. Um, I've just handed out an assignment that'll be due a week from today. Now, the assignment is problem solving oriented and we're not going to get into the problem solving aspect of it today. And so, if you want to start on the assignment over the weekend, there are examples in the book that talk about what we're going to do on Tuesday. So, either, you know, we'll do some in-class examples on Tuesday that'll set you up for the homework on Thursday. But if you want to get an early start, go for it. Um, I'm sure you can figure out the problem solving stuff from the examples that are provided in the text. Last time where we left off is talking about precipitation. And we stopped when I just gave you the most basic overview of what causes precipitation. And that overview is the cause of precipitation is warm, moist air that's at ground level is somehow forced upward. And we'll talk about the three main things that forces the air upward. But in each case, once the air that's warm and moist gets forced upward, the same thing happens. The air cools because of what's called an adiabatic process. As the air rises, it expands and cools. As the air cools, the relative humidity increases because um, warm air can absorb more moisture than cool air. And so as this warm, moist air is starting to cool off, what that means is that it's getting closer and closer to saturation. The maximum amount of precipitation that can be uh, held by a certain quantity of air. And when it finally rises enough and is cooled enough that it does reach saturation, then the water vapor begins to condense on nuclei. So it may be dust particles, it may be other droplets of aerosol, but then these droplets of water begin to grow, they get bigger, they collide with other droplets, and then finally when there is enough weight to each of those droplets to overcome the forces that keep it suspended, then they'll fall to the ground. So this figure is showing that adiabatic cooling effect. The overarching cause for all precipitation is that warm, moist air was forced upward and cooled. And this is showing that, on average, the cooling rate is about one degree Celsius per thousand uh, meters. One degree Celsius per hundred meters. It's per hundred meters, not per thousand. So this is showing that an air parcel that's at ground level is 10 degrees Celsius. When it, has ri when it has risen by 1,000 meters, it cooled off to zero. When it rises another 1,000 meters, it cools off to negative 10, and so on. Yeah? Is the dew point the same ground level as is a function of how much moisture can be held by the air at a certain temperature? And so the dew point up above is going to be different because the air is cooler up there. The air aloft is cooler than generally than air at ground level. There are sometimes inversions where that an inversion you may have heard of is where it's actually warm air up above. Um, and that sort of traps the cold air beneath and there can be a lot of air pollution. But in general, there's this cooling trend and so the dew point's different aloft. So these are the three things that force warm, moist air upward. Convergence, orography, and convection. Convergence is where two fronts come together. One of them is cool, one of them is warm, or it can be pressure fronts. And uh, the arriving air is forced to rise up over the existing air. And then because of that rising, then there's a cooling of the moist air. So extratropical cyclonic convergence. And so we have uh, two fronts together. And when, they first, when the, the two fronts first come in contact with each other, there can be a distinct line, a, a boundary between them. And you can see here we've got cold air that's dense, warm air that's less dense. And so why would cold and warm air be in contact with each other? Sometimes it's because one of the air masses has been over water. And in the fall, like right now, um, the air that's immediately over water is going to be warmer because water retains its heat longer than the ground does. And just this morning as I was driving on Route 2, 
I could see over the Ohio River there's like a cloud only over the river. And the reason why is that there's this warm body of water and lots of evaporation and as the warm air rises then it was a forming a cloud that was basically just exactly over the river. So here you've got warm air coming in contact with less, uh, with cooler air that's more dense and uh, as there as there's wind between the two of them, there are vortices and an eddy where uh, the warm air will protrude into the cold air and then the warm air is actually getting forced upward simultaneously. So this isn't just in two dimensions, it's, it's uh, intruding into the cold air as we look from above and then it's also starting to go up on top of the cold air. And as it gets up on top, there's a cross-sectional view here that's showing this warm air getting forced up above the mass of cooler air, and then precipitation is forming. Um, all right, so there's a lot to these figures. I'd suggest that you look at them and really ponder what's happening. Uh, you know, look at it in the textbook, but unfortunately we have to sort of speed through a little bit so we can't stare at this as long as it deserves because this is actually a really interesting figure that deserves more of our attention than we've got time for today. Um, as I mentioned, the adiabatic lapse rate is uh, about one degree per hundred meters or 9.8 uh, Celsius per kilometer. Um, that's the dry adiabatic lapse rate and the saturated adiabatic la lapse rate, that's talking about if the air is full of moisture, then the temperature doesn't change as much as when the air is completely dry. And so how much the temperature changes as you go upward through the atmosphere also is dependent on the relative humidity or the amount of moisture content in the, in the air. And so this is again showing the, uh, the frontal mixing and how the warm air comes up above the cool air and causes the, the cold front is pushing the warm air higher and uh, precipitation occurs because the, uh, the relative humidity increased as that warm moist air cooled off. Here is a picture of a tropical island and you can see that one side of the island is green and lush and appears to have some cloud cover over it and the other side of the island is just dry and there's probably over time going to be a lot less precipitation there. And this figure is identifying this is the windward side and this is the leeward side and so the wind patterns are that the wind is coming from the ocean this direction and then outward. And, uh, and so why is it so wet on this side and so dry over here if we know that precipitation is caused by lifting? Okay, the mountains. So there's mountains here, but why does that, you know, it's, why is this side of the mountain dry and that side of the mountain moist? Okay, so the air is forced up over the mountain. It loses, it gets rid of all of its moisture over here. As it's lifting, it sort of rains itself out. And then by the time that air has lifted and made it up over the mountain, there's nothing left to uh, precipitate on the other side of the island. Um, it's not rising anymore. So it, all of the moisture that had to be removed from the air because it was becoming super saturated is gone. Um, so here is a cross-sectional view of what we call uplift and orography. Orography just means there's an obstacle in the way that's causing the uh, air to be lifted. So you can see on the windward side of the mountain it's going to be wetter because that is where it's going through the elevation change. The elevation change that causes warm mi moist air to cool off. And once it cools off, the relative humidity increases until it's forced to uh, precipitate. And then on the back side of the mountain, it's more dry. So that's orography. There's an interesting uh, study that was done many years ago that was studying, uh, you know, is this just theory or does it actually occur? Is it measurable? What this figure shows is uh, at different parts of the United States, elevation of different locations versus how much precipitation they get in a year. 
And what it showed is that, for example, you can see here's the curve for New Hampshire. As elevation increases, so does the mean annual precipitation. And so it's wetter in the areas of New Hampshire that have a higher elevation. The same is true to an extent for Guatemala. It gets wetter, but then as the elevation goes higher and higher, uh, the precipitation decreases. And that is because it so happens that the high elevations, it's a high desert in Guatemala. So the orographic effect is pronounced until you get to the point where the air isn't being lifted anymore um, or is, uh, is over a, a body that doesn't have any moist air to begin with. You know, if you force dry air to rise, there's not going to be precipitation. It has to be warm, moist air rising for there to be precipitation. The third phenomenon that causes lifting is convection. And this is the effect of the afternoon thunderstorm, as my dad calls it. My father is just terrified of flying during the summer through Chicago or in, really anywhere during the summer because of all the delays that they have during the summer because of the afternoon thunderstorm. And the afternoon thunderstorm occurs when, during the day, sunshine is uh, beating down on the ground surface and the, the ground starts to warm up. And it gets really warm towards uh, 3, 4, 5 o'clock in the afternoon when the sun's been beating down on the ground all day. Then there are these thermals that raise air um, and, you know, birds you can see flying around without flapping their wings, they're riding thermals like this. It's the air is rising because it was heated at the ground surface. And so it, it's hot air rises and that's what happens during the afternoon. And as it rises, then it's forced to cool off. And then as it cools off, there's, it kind of looks like a mushroom cloud. You know, as you're driving across Kansas or some of the really flat states, it looks like maybe there was a nuclear bomb that was set off somewhere, but it's just clouds forming because of convection. So convective lifting is the third of the phenomena that can cause air to rise. So frontal lifting, orography, and convective lifting. Any questions about those? Here's a cutaway that shows conceptually what happens during a hurricane and why there's so much moisture during a storm event like that. And uh, not surprisingly, it's because of lifting. Um, air that is very moist at the surface of the water is lifted. And this figure on the top is showing how far away you are from the center of a hurricane and uh, how much precipitation Let's see, where did they have, oh, uh, wind speed. I thought I had a figure, oh, here it is. Yeah, it's showing the amount of precipitation along uh, with these arrows. So there's light to moderate rain right at the center, heavy rain. The further away you get, the rain decreases because you're further from the location of where the lifting was. Now, all three of those phenomena cause uh, condensation growth. The droplet growth begins at some sort of a nucleus. The uh, water vapor can't condense on itself, and so there has to be um, particles of suspended salt in the atmosphere, and so that could be if there are waves uh, breaking against the shore, that can send little particles of dust and salt up into the atmosphere, and that can be enough for clouds to form on. Um, during the Olympics in Beijing, they were trying to ensure good weather by, and it's not just in Beijing they do this, they do it in several places, where you want to try and encourage precipitation, sometimes airplanes will fly around and they will seed the rainfall. And uh, commonly what they use to seed rainfall is small particles of silver. I'm not exactly sure why they use silver, it seems expensive, but, and that's the thing that they often use is uh, uh, particleized silver, and then that provides the nuclei for the moisture con to condense onto. Um, so they're usually very small particles, and um, it may be snow, hail, sleet. These snow, hail, and sleet, we don't worry about so much in the engineering side of things, although they're very important for providing agricultural runoff. Um, but it's rainfall that, from the engineering structural standpoint, you know, we worry about because it's rainfall that's going to get 
the streams and the conveyance networks full very quickly. Um, snow usually doesn't provide as much uh, fast flash flooding as rainfall does, the exception being when it gets warm very quickly. There's been heavy snow and suddenly it gets very warm and maybe it's suddenly getting warm at the same time that there's a rainstorm, then that can cause really problematic flooding. But rainfall is the precipitation type that we focus on the most in this course because it's usually what governs sizing of uh, culverts and everything else. And uh, you can have snow when it's warm at ground level and you can have rain when it's cold at ground level. This figure is showing uh, the probability of getting snow versus rain based on the temperature of the surface. And uh, one of the unusual things is hail. And we know, of course, hail is frozen liquid that's coming from the sky and it's usually happening during the summertime. And the reason why it's frozen is because it's so much cooler at high elevations than it is at low elevations. So this is showing that sort of the probability crossover occurs at about 37 degrees at the surface. And so if, if it's cool up above, you may get snow, but it's not going to last very long. It's not going to stick because the surface has to be frozen as well for it to stick. Yeah. Yeah, I think the size of the hail depends on how windy it is and uh, how high in the atmosphere the hail is forming. Because for it to get really big, it has to be blown around and the moisture is continuing to condense on that already. You know, if it's golf ball size and it's still up in the air, that means it's either falling through the humid and beginning to grow or it's so windy that the wind is keeping it aloft. So it's very rare for the large ones to form just because they usually have enough weight and mass to them to overcome the wind's effect of keeping it suspended. All right, let's watch a couple of videos that can set the stage for our discussion of evaporation. You can say that in hydrology today you watched water evaporate. That's how interesting the lecture was, is that you watched water evaporate. Uh, brilliant. This doesn't have flash player. Well, why would it, of course? Wait. Oh, good. All right. So here's a time-lapse video of water evaporating. There it is. Why did it evaporate? Why? It's not... Uh, I th boiling water is when it's 100 degrees Celsius, right? So. It's probably not 100 degrees Celsius wherever this is. Maybe it's somewhere warm, Arizona. But why was there water here and no longer there's not? Let's talk about the things that would improve evaporation speed. What are some of the factors that are going to affect how quickly this concrete area evaporates? All right, temperature. What's that? Vapor pressure. It's the temperature that drives the vapor pressure. You're exactly right. Vapor pressure is important. Um, the warmer the liquid is, the, so w w I guess I should say temperature of what? Because we've got several different things in the picture. We've got the surface, the liquid, and the air. All three, okay. So let's just distinguish surface, the liquid, and the air. All right. Yep, that'll have an effect. What else? Surface area. And there's also the humidity of the air. If you have very dry air, you know, if they're doing this in Arizona, the evaporation rate will be much more quick than if this is being done in West Virginia. Uh, humidity of air, how much wind there is, has an effect on evaporation rate. Because if you have a wet area, the air right above the wet area is probably already saturated with moisture. 
And so if you have wind blowing that saturated air out of the way and it's bringing the dry air over the water, then that can increase the rate of evaporation. So this picture sort of uh, gets us thinking about how quickly things can evaporate, how quickly a liquid can evaporate. You know, if this was alcohol, then it would evaporate faster than if it was water because alcohol has a higher vapor pressure. All right. Let's see, the Liedenfrost effect. An error occurred. Oh. Yes, yes I would, but I'm not made of water. The water isn't thinking. It, an air pocket? Yeah, that's right. It's like uh, the droplet of water is evaporating, and so it's, it's actually not air, it's H2O, it's vapor phase, it's water vapor underneath it, and so here's the heat source, hot. And uh, so it's dancing around because it's evaporating very quickly on the underside of the droplet. Isn't that how the, those rocks move in the oh, I don't know about moving rocks. Yeah, they, the rocks that have trails behind them, you know, like footprints, that's, like someone picked them up, and like water gets under them and heats up and pushes them I've never heard of that. Yeah. Sounds interesting. I'm going to have to look into that. Okay, one last video to show you. Now, I, I wish that I had made a video like this last January. I could have because it was so cold here in January, but it's also cold in Canada, and thankfully they made this video for us. Yeah, you throw boiling water up in the air. Did you do it? Did you burn yourself? No, good. What are you doing, Sam? So what I've done is boiled water in the kettle. So it's boiling water. So We're going to pour it in here. Kettle full of hot and water. Throw it in the air and it's going to evaporate. Ready? Oh, wow. <laughs> That's amazing. Usually if it was warm out, it would go plunk in the snow. But. <laughs> That's so cool. <laughs> So like I guess another fog. thing we should do on the list crazy. is the difference between the <laughs> air temperature and the liquid temperature. Because if she was just throwing liquid water that wasn't heated up, if she was throwing 20 degrees Celsius water in the air instead of 100 degrees Celsius, it probably wouldn't have done that, right? It's, it's no coincidence that that hot water is straight from the tea kettle. So that goes back to vapor pressure is that something's going to have more of a tendency to evaporate when it's at a higher temperature. So those are all three very stimulating videos, I think. Now, one of the key drivers of evaporation on the global scale is the sun. It's uh, atmospheric radiation. And a part of the homework that I just gave you, that the part that you can begin working on, uh, is you're going to have to download some solar radiation data for New Mexico. And solar radiation is important because the, the models that we have to look at how quickly evaporation is going to occur almost unanimously look at both uh, how much energy is there to cause the water to evaporate and also how much wind is there or transport to move the uh, moisture away from the original surface. So what this figure is showing is uh, the spectrum of radiation that actually makes it to the Earth's surface. And the figure up above is showing different gases and what spectrum they absorb. And so we're very lucky to have ozone in the atmosphere. If you look at O3, it is absorbing in the ultraviolet range. Ultraviolet rays are the ones that give us sunburn and cause cancer and can damage DNA. Um, but in the visible range, all of a sudden, you'll notice that the radiation gets through in the visible range, the, the light that we have to be able to see where we're going is uh, because there's very little absorptivity of radiation 
due to the gases that are in the atmosphere. So um, here is a diagram that shows how much energy gets through the, uh, the atmosphere. And what it shows is that the radiation that's coming in is equal to the radiation that's going out in terms of the total energy. Um, 100 units here on the figure that's saying 100 units of incoming radiation. What that corresponds to is 1367 watts per square uh, watts per square meter. That's how much radiation actually comes from the sun and makes it to Earth. And um, much of that radiation is scattered by the air or reflected by clouds. Now, the stuff that's scattered by air, that six out of a hundred is mostly the ultraviolet uh, spectrum. Some of the UV still gets through, and that's why we get sunburned. But um, if we didn't have ozone in the atmosphere, then a lot more would get through. Uh, some of the radiation is reflected by clouds, depending on the spectrum and the wavelength of the radiation. Some of the, the radiation goes right through the clouds. Uh, some of it is reflected by the surface, and some of it is absorbed by the surface, depending on the um, depending on the wavelength of the, uh, of the radiation. And then you can see that the same amount that came in goes out. 100 units of, radiation, of, of energy will exit. Um, there shouldn't be an accumulation of heat, although there, over time there is sort of an accumulation of heat uh, because the, oceans are, the ocean area is growing and ocean is able to absorb more energy than like the snow caps and the glaciers that used to be there in place of it. Um, so the radiation that comes in is what we call uh, short wave, and what goes out is long wave radiation. Here is a figure that's showing an important effect, and that is that the angle of incidence has an impact on how much radiation there is as a function of latitude. So part of the reason why it's very dim at the poles is that you have the same incident radiation coming in, but it's projected over a wider area. At the equator, this incident radiation that is a rectangle is going to be projecting about a rectangle of the same area. But then down at the poles, the further away you get from the equator, that rectangle is being projected over a very wide area and so the radiation intensity decreases. Now the globe tilts seasonally of course and so it's not always that the equator is what's pointed straight at the sun. In the summertime the northern hemisphere is tilted more towards the sun. In the wintertime it's the southern hemisphere that's tilted towards the sun and that's what makes it winter and summer is the fact of um, you know, which the northern or the southern hemisphere is pointed more towards the sun during the different seasons. And here's another figure that's kind of interesting that I didn't know that uh, seasonally the distance from the sun varies. Um, that during uh, January, which happens to be when North America is tilted away from the sun, and you can see here it's showing uh, it's sort of tilted away. Uh, but yeah, yeah, okay. So wintertime, it's tilted away. Summertime, the northern hemisphere is tilted more towards the sun. But then in addition to that, the, uh, the Earth is closer during our winter and further away during the uh, winter of the southern hemisphere. So there's a variation in the orbit. It's showing different dates when you have 12 hours of light, 12, 12 hours of darkness at the equinox. The longest day of the year for the northern hemisphere is the 21st and 22nd of June. That's when at the North Pole there's complete daylight. At the South Pole there's complete darkness. Okay. Um, we won't actually take a look at this link, but sometimes this is a really good explanation of relative humidity. And that's something they talk about on the news a lot when they're trying to explain heat index and how, how hot a certain temperature feels. And the heat index is taking into account not only the temperature, but um, your body's ability to cool itself off. And the body sweats because the evaporation process consumes energy. 
And so if the moisture that's on the surface of your skin is evaporating, then what that means is that uh, it's carrying away heat to go through the phase change. When it goes from a liquid to a gas, it cools you off because those water molecules require energy in order to make the transition. So we know that uh, water vapor is a gas when the air temperature is below 100 degrees, but boiling begins at 100 degrees. And so not every molecule in a container of water has the same amount of kinetic energy. So let's say here is a basin of water. And we talked a little bit about this in fluid mechanics, but it's been a while. We got a basin of water and there's just particles. It's made up of a bunch of H2O molecules. And they're mixing around with each other and colliding. And occasionally, one particle will be collided by another particle. This particle bumps into it, and it's going to receive some of the kinetic energy. And so now, even though all of the water is the same temperature inside of this container, the average temperature is the same, one of the molecules will have more kinetic energy because it was just bumped into by another molecule of water. And so it's now moving around with a greater speed, and it may have enough kinetic energy to go into the uh, vapor phase. The liquid water will become gaseous water, even though it's not 100 degrees Celsius. Um, but the, uh, the vapor pressure is high enough that a certain fraction of the liquid will evaporate. So this is uh, a close-up conceptual diagram showing evaporation and that there is a barrier between all of the molecules going into the vapor phase because the, uh, the air is pushing down on the liquid with atmospheric pressure. And at sea level, atmospheric pressure is 101.325 newtons per meter squared. So that's atmospheric pressure resisting this liquid from entering the vapor phase. And at room temperature, the vapor pressure will be very low, maybe about uh, 10,000 pascals maximum. But then as the temperature increases, because we're adding heat, then the vapor pressure gets higher and higher until um, at 100 degrees Celsius, the vapor pressure equals the atmospheric pressure, and that means that the average water molecule that's in the container now has enough kinetic energy to evaporate. But even ice has evaporation. Um, the process of a solid going to the vapor phase is called sublimation. And so even ice water molecules that are in the solid phase, a certain fraction of those water molecules will have enough kinetic energy to go directly into the vapor phase, even though it won't transition into the liquid state. Um, but the fraction of molecules that has enough energy to evaporate is very low when it's a solid. So we measure the quantity of gas above the liquid by the air pressure. And the quantity of water molecules that have enough evaporation potential uh, to actually go into the vapor phase, we measure with the vapor pressure. So what causes the liquid, the liquid water molecules to vaporize is energy. And what's going to deliver that energy out in the environment is going to be the sun. That's what delivers the energy required for evaporation. Over the surface of the Earth, if you were just to uh, average how much evaporation there is, including the oceans, including deserts, jungles, the North Pole, the South Pole, the uh, overall the world average for how much evaporation there is is three millimeters per day. And so um, that means that if you have less rainfall than three millimeters per day in a certain location, then there's going to be a net deficit in the amount of moisture that's, that's occurring there. And of course, there can only be as much evaporation as there is uh, rainfall unless groundwater wells are being tapped. In, in California right now, for example, they haven't had any precipitation for a really long time. They're in a serious drought, but a lot of people are still um, growing crops. They're still watering lawns, and a lot of that water comes from 
subsurface sources. They, they have groundwater wells, and so they're irrigating from those. And so there's still evaporation from those locations, even though it hasn't precipitated. Yeah, yeah, because of the drought. There was a news article that was about rich celebrities in um, uh, some town in California, like Oprah Winfrey, Tom Cruise. They have these enormous estates. And uh, if you fly over, you can see who's rich and who's poor because they're trucking in water to irrigate their yards. They, the, the city has said no more, you can't use any city water to do irrigation. And so a lot of really hyper-rich people have been paying farmers to bring trucks of water so that they can continue to irrigate their plants. Kind of interesting. The energy that's required for vaporization is called the latent heat of vaporization. That is how much energy it takes for water to go from liquid to a gas. And uh, this is in terms of joules per kilograms of water. And it varies as a function of temperature to an extent. Uh, 2.5 times 10 to the sixth joules per kilogram. And then that decreases with the, uh, the temperature of the water. And so very warm water takes a little bit less energy to uh, volatilize because you're not having to heat it up to the vapor phase. Whereas water at zero degrees Celsius, you have to heat it up and then it has to go through the transition, the, the transition of uh, liquid to vapor. So this constant is used in a lot of our calculations to estimate how much evaporation there's going to be for a watershed because we're saying that um, we want to know uh, for a certain watershed how much of the precipitation is going to run off, how much of it is going to infiltrate, and how much of it is going to evaporate. It's kind of a, uh, an overall balance over the long term can be done, uh, can be done and all of those things should be in equilibrium. So again, it comes down to solar radiation. And this diagram is showing the fraction of radiation that comes in and how it is leaving the atmosphere as shortwave radiation or as longwave radiation. Is this, was that the last slide? OK, yeah. So the thing I want to show you next is a uh, presentation that I did for the West Virginia Department of Environmental Protection. And um, I did a project for them trying to quantify how much evaporation there is in a certain watershed. Let me unhide those slides, and we'll take a look at those. There's a watershed in West Virginia called the uh, Greenbrier Watershed. And you already know about nested hierarchies in that you know, within a certain watershed, there will be lots of little small watersheds. But what they've done is they've broken the state down into about 40 main watersheds. And this is one of them. It's a very beautiful part of the state, uh, the Greenbrier. Uh, HU8 means hydrologic unit. Um, and it's a very large watershed, about 1,650 square miles. Very little of it is water. And what the DEP was interested in is uh, a budget so that they can tell businesses that are interested in locating to West Virginia how much water they can use. Because there is uh, a lot of new industry coming into the state because of the Marcellus Shale and um, hydraulic fracturing of uh, rock underground releases, natural gas. And so the state is trying to attract companies not only to, to harvest that gas, but also turn it into chemicals, process it in West Virginia, then transport it out of state to be used. But they need to know how much water can be used, how much, can you consist, how much water will there be on a consistent basis. And so part of that was looking at how much water comes into this watershed, how much goes out, and how much could be consumed. 
So here's just a little bit of information about that uh, watershed and where it's located. Overall, if you look at a watershed, the water that comes in and water comes out can be set up as a mass balance. And this is a mass balance that's showing the amount of water that comes, that runs off, the flow rate out of this watershed, and there is a river that drains water out of the Greenbrier watershed. It's about here. The, the amount of water that's coming out depends on, first of all, the flow in, if there was a river flowing into the watershed. And in this case, there isn't a, a stream that's coming in, but there is obviously going to be a lot of precipitation falling all over the surface of it. But there are losses along the way. Just because you have precipitation doesn't mean all of that precipitation will run out of the watershed. You have to account for evaporation. ET stands for eva evapotranspiration, and that's a long word. Evaporation is when liquid water evaporates from a wet surface. Transpiration is when water is lost from a plant, like the, the plant is sort of exhaling moisture. Uh, and so the combined effect of evapotranspiration is talking about both the water that is uh, from free surfaces of, of liquid that's evaporating in the atmosphere and then also transpiration from plants. Okay, so ET is going to reduce how much runoff there is. And so if there's a lot of evaporation in a watershed, that's going to decrease how much runoff there is. Uh, there's also groundwater recharge, which is uh, infiltration. Storage is if the water is trapped in ponds or reservoirs inside of the watershed, then it's not going to have runoff. Uh, LQ means whatever consumptive use there is in a watershed. If it's a, a drinking water utility that's taking water out of the river and they're putting it into, um, they're putting it into trucks and then it's going off as bottled water somewhere, then that's not going to stay in the watershed. If it's a drinking water utility that is putting water into people's pipes and then that, that water goes from the pipes into the toilet, then it goes to the toilet, to the treatment plant, and then it gets into the river, some of the large quantity use is going to get back into the outflow, but some of it could leave the watershed. Uh, and then agricultural uses. If you are watering livestock or crops, that's a way of having water leave a watershed. And, this AG is uh, a kind of a big issue in India because India is another place that has experienced some water stress where they have shortages of water in a lot of the country, but they also have a lot of agri agricultural regions that grow rice especially. And rice needs really a lot of water to grow, but when you export rice, really what you're doing is you're exporting water. And they've estimated that a kilogram of rice may take up to 1,000 kilograms of water to grow over the duration of from when it's planted to when it's harvested. And so um, agricultural demands can really take a lot of water out of a watershed. Now in the, uh, the project I was working on, I got data about where this watershed is located from a gov one government website that has the shape files of uh, where the boundaries of that watershed are. I was able to quantify what the river flow is by stream gauge data. The United States Geological Survey has stream gauges all across the country and they do have one for this um, Greenbrier watershed that says pretty far back the, uh, the flow data. And I can't quite make it out on here, but I think the flow data goes back more than 50 years uh, on a daily basis what the average daily flow of the stream was. And then the, uh, the precipitation data that I got is this PRISM data I've showed you before from uh, Oregon State University, and it is a way of saying over the entire area what is the average, the spatial average of uh, precipitation. Um, I also had to know how much sunshine there was, and so I was able to get some data from uh, Bluefield, and uh, it, Bluefield's close enough to the watershed. It's not actually in the watershed. Here you can see, here's Bluefield. It was close enough that I assumed how much sunshine they're getting here is roughly equivalent to the amount of sunshine that's in the watershed area. So uh, in applying this approach of trying to say how much water can a company use, 
you have to look at all of the GIS data that's available, and you also have to uh, prepare it for analysis, kind of process the data in a way that the DEP would be able to uh, replicate in the future. One part of that is the rainfall data. And you remember you did the Thiessen method for your in-class exercise? Well, this is my version of the Thiessen method. Um, the, the gridded rainfall data that's available from PRISM is uh, every day they say how much rainfall data there was, how much rainfall there was at each one of these points. Now, there isn't a rain gauge at each one of these points. What it does is it interpolates from where the rain gauges are to uh, an average precipitation depth. And so working with uh, another guy here at Marshall who's kind of a GIS expert, he wrote a program that would take the data that comes from PRISM and calculate an average precipitation depth for the entire watershed area using the PRISM gridded data. Um, we already looked at the watershed characteristics. An example of the type of question that they might ask for a watershed is, uh, on average, how much runoff is there? And this is showing where the Greenbrier River uh, comes together with another one. This is considered the outlet for the watershed. So in the month of July, how much runoff is there? And as you might expect, that is going to vary quite a bit over the year, the amount of uh, runoff. And uh, in July, you can see that there would be only 677 CFS of runoff on average. And that's over the entire month of July. Um, and that flow data goes back from 86 to the present, <clears throat> only because there's more flow data than that. But I uh, only went back to 86 because that's how far back the, uh, um, the solar radiation data went that I had. Now, averages are just that. It's only the middle of the data. And so if you wanted to know how much water is always going to be there for a company and how much can they rely on being present, think about if a factory was right here at this location and they always needed at least 677 CFS to do whatever it is, to make chemicals or to uh, provide cooling at a power plant. If they required 677 all the time, well, they're not going to be able to operate in August or September because both of those months are less than 677. But beyond that, this is just 50% of the time in July it is 677 because an average, this is showing a bell curve, and what this means is that some Julys are going to have more than 677 CFS. Some Julys are going to have less than 677 CFS. And so, uh, a company has to ask itself, how frequently can it tolerate failure? Or how often can they plan on not having as much water as they need? And so uh, we delved a little bit deeper and we asked a, a more specific question. What if, uh, if you have to keep 500 CFS in the river just to keep fish alive? Like you can't take all of the water out of the river. You have to provide some of the, some base flow for habitat. And um, so if you have to provide 500 CFS, then how much water could you withdraw during the worst march on record? So now worst in period is giving you a little bit more of a safety factor. And um, so this is showing the minimum monthly runoff for all of the years since 1986 until the present, how much was the lowest. And so if we just look at uh, March, you can see in March there's 1091, so that is an additional 591 over and above the 500 that you'd have to leave in the river for habitat. But if you were going to consume 591 in March, you wouldn't be able to consume that much in July because in July there isn't even enough in the river to really maintain this 500 CFS that you might need for habitat. Um, so this is uh, another kind of thing that we had to do with the model, is estimate how much evaporation there was. And to estimate evaporation, we looked at how much precipitation there was. And uh, sometimes there's a lot of precipitation. Sometimes there's a little bit. And the 
standard deviation size is what's here in this column, and this is what the average amount of precipitation was. And so from the precipitation amount and from the runoff data, we were able to calculate the average evaporation that was coming on a monthly basis. And so you can see that during the summer months, there's a lot of evaporation. And in the wintertime, there's not as much evaporation because uh, it's cooler then. Um, and during the summer, there's more evaporation because there's more solar radiation to drive the evaporation. There's more energy causing that uh, change from the liquid phase to the vapor phase. All right, here are some of the equations that you're going to have to use to solve the first couple of homework problems. And we'll go over this in detail next Tuesday. But uh, what the, the combined approach says is that uh, you have to estimate evaporation rate by both the, uh, the radiation that's available. And this expression is talking all about how much radiation is there and also about the, uh, the temperature of the ground relative to the temperature of the air. So the difference in ground temperature and air temperature also drives the amount of uh, evaporation. And then the, uh, the wind speed is another thing that can drive evaporation. So the, uh, let me just jump through some of the technical stuff and show you overall how good is a model at predicting the amount of runoff that there's going to be. That's ultimately the thing that we were after is being able to predict how much water is available for industry. And so if all you were to do is to look at a, a model of evaporation and, a mo and precipitation data, then there is sort of a linear-ish trend to the data, um, but it only fits it with an R squared of 0.74. So there's still a lot of variation there. You're not always going to predict how much runoff there is. This is on the x-axis is the predicted runoff. The uh, vertical axis is the actual amount of runoff that there was. Um, so really what this is a gauge of is how accurate were we at um, modeling evaporation. And uh, so about 74% 74, 74 of, uh, of the data can be attributed to the model. And that gives you an idea of the calculations we'll do on Tuesday. Um, they, there's some error in the empirical models we use to estimate runoff. And, uh, so the equations look nice, but the real world application of them, it doesn't all fit the trend line like it's supposed to. Well, we'll leave it there for today. Um, I will post the exam grades on MU Online when I finish grading the exams, and we will have a chance to take a look at them on Tuesday.